In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Sprasnikam. You know, most of us from our youth, from the time of our childhood, we have uh, spurned discipline and correction. And these are things that we find repugnant. As the Holy Fathers say, all of us, we, we seek to increase our pleasure and decrease our pain. <clears throat> In fact, <clears throat> most sin... When you really examine it, most disobedience to God is a way of mitigating our pain and the discomfort that we feel in life. And so it is inevitable that because God loves us, he also disciplines us. He sends us difficulties, trials, sicknesses, people, all these different things in order that we would correct our attitude that we would humble ourselves and that we would repent of our sins. This is what we see today with the holy new martyrs and confessors of Russia. It's often not spoken about, or maybe sometimes I think it's overlooked or not examined more in depth, but the age of holy Russia had essentially, you could say, almost passed on by the time of the Bolshevik Revolution and the persecution. The Russia of the 19th century was extremely pious. You know, people had large families, people went to church, participation in church was the center point, the focal point for people's lives. In fact, you know, you read stories that every man in the village would go to um, uh, <clears throat> Vespers every evening. Obviously, the Tsar and his family, uh, by the time that they came to power, they had a chapel, they had daily services. Prayer, asceticism, large families, monasticism, all these things were thriving in Russia. And slowly they began to, it began to lose this asceticism, in fact, I remember reading, I can't remember who it was or someone quoted it to me, but they said at the time <clears throat> that if you were in Holy Russia, you essentially saw no difference between married people and monastics. Everyone was very ascetical and holy and pious in their life. And so there wasn't, you know, you could say a big contradiction or separation between the two, as is often talked about today. It was the same spirit. It was the same spirit, the same, you could say, energy. But as Russia became less and less pious and more and more given over to worldly cares and pleasures and desires, we see from the writings of the saints <clears throat> that they foretold, and we see this with Saint Seraphim of Sorav, Saint uh, John of Kronstadt, and other elders, I believe the Optina elders as well, I believe, prophesied that there would come a great discipline, a great reckoning in Russia. And all of this came about because this desire through the Bolshevik Revolution to overthrow the Tsar. And the Tsar was obviously, I think all of us know this, but is seen as being God's representative to the people of Russia. This does not mean that the Tsar was a perfect man or that every Tsar is perfect. This is the same thing with priests. Priests are Christ's representative to his people. This does not mean that they don't have personal foibles, shortcomings in their character or their personality or whatever else. It means merely that God elects people fallen people, because that's all he has to choose from, to become his leaders and representatives. And so it was that when the martyrdom of Tsar Nicholas took place, <clears throat> a terrible judgment fell on the Russian people that they would answer for this sin. And this is how it is. We have sins that are both individual, we have sins that are of our family, and then we have sins that are of our nation. In a sense, all sin 
even individual sin affects the people around us. I can't tell you how many times somebody has come up for confession, a parent, and they've confessed something, and then the minute that they leave confession, their child comes up to confession, and their child's confession is almost the exact same as the parent. Maybe one or two things different. So we see this even in families, that the passions that rage in the parents also rage in the children, and the passions of the people in a nation become a collective energy, a collective sin. And so it is that the discipline of God fell upon the Russian people, this chastening, this purification, this judgment of God. Now this fell on the Russian people not because God did not love them. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It is the byproduct of God's love for his people. <clears throat> a parent never disciplines their children, right? Because they don't love them. I mean, maybe some parents do and they're not quality parents. But when you see a parent who just neglects a child and just lets them do whatever they want, talk back to them however they want, watch as much TV and video games as they want, you can see that the parent has just neglected their duty. They've just given up or they just don't care. The love of a parent for their children is to create in them and to cultivate in them godly character. And children often push back against this or want to get a little more than what we say and whatnot. And there's always some struggle in parenting. It's just the nature of it. But we do it and we stick to it because we love our children. And so too, we read today in the epistle of St. Paul that the Lord chasteneth the ones that he loves. He disciplines them. He corrects them. He allows calamity to befall them. People often think that this is God <clears throat> sending evil, like that God sent the Bolsheviks upon the Russian people. And this is a misunderstanding of the will of God. It is rather that God withholds his protection. He withholds his blessing. And when God withholds his blessing and his protection, evil as a consequence of the fallenness of this world befalls people. I remember speaking with one of the people who was very familiar <clears throat> with... Um, <clears throat> the church in San Francisco, and she was saying to me that, <clears throat> you know, there were a number of people of the laity that persecuted St. John. You know, they made false accusations against him. They said that he was stealing and doing these things. They even took St. John to court, St. John Maximovich to court, the archbishop. And she said, and in, in basically in almost all of their lives, they all suffered terrible physical ailments or illnesses, or difficulties befell those people. And it wasn't that God was, in a sense, punishing or afflicting them with this. It was rather that he was giving them the opportunity for repentance. He removed his protection from them. And as a consequence, the sin and the evil and the sinfulness of this world befell them. But it is not to their destruction because God does not wish to destroy us. Rather, he allows these things to come upon us so that we can find the means of repentance, the humility of heart, so that we're able to look at our own life and see what needs to be corrected. In all things that God does, his desire, his desire, is that we would humbly turn to him. In fact, there's a kind of a popular or famous saying where people will say, God will not give you more than you can handle. You ever hear this? People are very fond of this saying. God will not give you more than you can handle. And that, in fact, is not true. In fact, even the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ was more than he could handle. It wore him down physically so much that he was unable to carry it. And this, as an archetype, 
and a witness to us that God will send crosses to our life that are more than we can bear and that we need the help and assistance of other people in order to bear our cross at times because it is crushing. This is why we have the church. This is why we have priests and confession and the Eucharist and friends in order to bear the crosses of this life. You know, the popularity in the West in Christianity is that you are saved by the cross. In fact, I remember speaking with a Western Christian woman one time, and she said to me, Jesus died on the cross so that we don't have to. All of Christianity in the West is very passive. And you could say, I had a spiritual father who was very fond of saying, Western Christianity is crossless. It is crossless. And to this woman, she said this to me, and I said, I just, I'm sorry, but I don't think that this is true. I said, because 11 of the 12 disciples were martyred. And the 12th one, St. John, you know, was tortured, burned, and eventually lay down in a grave and gave up his ghost. So you could really say that all 12 of them were martyred. If it was the case that Christ died on the cross so that we don't have to, why would the saints, why would the apostles, the martyrs, the confessors, the disciples of the 70, why would they also take up this same cross and endure the same crucifixion as Christ? In fact, St. Nic Nicodemus of Mount Athos is a beautiful saying, and he said, you will enter paradise through suffering, just like our Lord Jesus Christ and all of the saints. No one enters paradise without the cross. We Orthodox Christians are saved through the cross and our participation in it. And I can't remember the saint who said it, but I often think about it. He says, the cross of Christ does not make sense when you are looking up at it. The cross of Christ only makes sense when you are being crucified with him and are looking out from the cross. We have so many times in our life, our whole theology, our whole approach to life is so upside down. We are trying to avoid and mitigate the cross at every turn. You know, so many times we say, well, what's the minimal amount that I can fast? What's the minimal amount of prayers? What's, you know, what's the least I can give financially? Or we even have a whole service of marriage with a crowning and martyrdom and all the theology from the saints telling us, have children, this is the martyrdom of marriage. And then people say, well, what's the least amount of children I can have? Constantly, 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 People are trying to avoid the cross, to get away from it, to not be crucified, to not be crushed by it. Myself included. We all struggle with this temptation. We want to increase our pleasure, our enjoyment of life, and we want to decrease are suffering, emotional, physical. But, brothers and sisters, this is the only way for us to be saved. We cannot be saved 
without the crucifixion. This is both the crucifixion of Christ and our own personal martyrdom and crucifixion. When we see the glorious example of the new martyrs and confessors of the Russian land, we should feel great love for them, great affection for them. We should fervently turn to them in prayer. But, but, we must not forget that their persecution came at the hands of other Orthodox Christians. Who was persecuting and sending people to prison? If, what was it, 94%, I believe, of the Russian population were baptized Orthodox Christians? Who was it that was renouncing the faith and their baptism? Who was it that was murdering them? But their very kinsfolk, their neighbors, family members, compatriots. It was other Russians. We cannot forget that this befell the country of Russia not just by some outside evil influence, but this happened internally. This happened internally by the renunciation of God. When the people turned away from God, when they renounced Jesus Christ, they lost the grace of their baptism and they became like wild animals. They truly became animalistic in their persecution of each other. This is a very sobering thought because if this could happen in Holy Russia, could this not happen too here in America? Could we lose the peace and the stability that we constantly pray for? We would be absolutely foolish to think that this could not happen here and that this could not befall us by our fellow Americans. And the reason that we repent, the reason that we share the gospel with people, the reason that we bring them to church is for the salvation of our souls and the salvation of their souls. And as a consequence of this, we experience repentance in our society and the peace and the grace of God covers us. It protects us. We must keep this repentance before our eyes. We should be mindful of all the things that are happening in our society. We should be working diligently, adamantly against the evil that is constantly trying to grow in our society. The darkness that is constantly seeking to devour individuals and families and the entire nation. May we see in Russia soberly what too could happen to us here. And may we redouble our efforts in repentance to bring repentance to our land, to spread the Holy Orthodox faith, that people would find the mystery of Jesus Christ, that they would receive the mystery of holy baptism, and that they would become God-like. 
always, 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 the devil prowls around like a lion, seeking to find those whom he can devour. May we be on guard in our country against the evil that seeks to destroy us. And may we have the holy example and intercession of the Russian confessors and new martyrs to strengthen us in our resolve to follow Jesus Christ with our whole heart and the commitment of our whole life. To him be all glory, honor, and worship with his Father and the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages.